Today we'll be talking about cranial nerve examinations. Um, this becomes an integral part of your exam. There is no reason at all why you wouldn't do a cranial nerve exam when you're doing examinations of the spinal segments, neurologically speaking. So this is just an extension of the spinal cord into the head. So anybody with headaches, dizziness, um, upper neck pain, um, doesn't really matter anything that in that area um, there's no good reason not to do a cranial nerve exam the fact is that the more frequently you do this the easier it becomes much like everything else and you should be able to get this exam done when it's not complicated by pathology you should be able to get it done in under 90 seconds um, so it's not a big time consuming thing neither you need to get into the habit of doing this on a regular basis and seeing what normal is so when you see abnormal it hits you um, you can't learn all of the abnormalities to the point where you can instantly recognize them but you can recognize when something isn't normal if you look at it sufficiently often now we're, this isn't about neuroanatomy um, I expect you to know this stuff it's background material we learned in school um, if you're unsure of it go review it um, but the way to look at cranial nerves is to think about the brainstem and the hind brain as an extension of the spinal cord, which of course it is actually the spinal cord and the extension of this, I assume. Anyway, think of the uh, uh, brainstem and the hind brain as an extension of the spinal cord, and you see the same things happening. So let's take C4. If I have a complete um, cut right through C4, and it's going through the C4 segment, what you'll see there is everything above that, at least for a while, will be normal. Um, there'll be no changes in the function of any of the neurological systems above C4. Below C4, you're going to see an upper motor neuron issue, um, along with sensory loss and all the rest of this stuff, but it's predominantly it's going to be lower motor neuron. Uh, sorry, upper motor neuron. At C4, though, if you test that segment, it will be lower motor neuron. So you've got the same thing with the cranial nerves, except the name changes a little bit. So we have supranuclear, infranuclear, and intranuclear lesions. Um, but the same thing happens. It's supranuclear. Everything below that level is going to be um, upper motor. Everything above it is going to be normal. Um, if it's intranuclear, it, everything um, at that, that cranial nerve is going to be lower motor. So you see the same patterns of dysfunction, whether you're looking at a spinal segment or a um, cranial nerve. Um, so this is not that difficult. Okay, and I know it's esoteric and the reason I think that we have problems with this is because cranial nerves are taught in the neurological um, area of physical therapy school. And Probably it shouldn't be. Um, a neuro, neurotherapist seeing the patient um, has a diagnosis basically handed to her um, or him. And um, what they're looking for now is basically assessing functional loss and how to recover that. Uh, but the diagnosis is generally made. So a cranial nerve exam for a physical therapist um, is probably less important than it is for a manual therapist because we need to know that the neurovascular system in a patient that we're going to possibly manipulate the neck is working as well as it can. Um, now finding a negative cranial nerve exam doesn't mean to say you can't do damage with your technique but at the very least you'll be able to re-examine the cranial nerves and see if you have done any damage. So this is a really important part of your job as a manual therapist um, and don't shortcut it just because this was underemphasized in manual therapy in school doesn't mean to say it should be underemphasized in practice okay for the more observant of you yes i've changed my shirt and actually it's a whole new day um okay so symptoms are where you always start with a neurological exam um and these are a bit more mm, multiple than they are in the spine so let's get going on cranial nerve one um anosmia or parosmia anosmia where you can't smell at all is unusual generally particularly if this is um, a single-sided problem unilateral problem um, in which case they don't know they have anosmia 
um, because they're smelling through the other side. Um, but parosmia is a deformity of smell. So this is the equivalent of parasthesia or tinnitus with hearing loss. It's a, it's a replacement um, sensation for denervation. Um, this can take a form of burnt toast, cedar chips, all of the traditional ones. Um, and this will, they can smell this whether it's unilateral or bilateral. Uh, hemianopia or quadrinopia. It's amazing, but you can, can lose half of your visual field, provided it's the lateral field, not the medial field, you can lose half of your um, field of view and not know about it. And that's because uh, to see over to the left of me now, I would actually turn my head to the left. So that blind spot will move with me. So the patient may not be aware of this. Uh, could be hemianopia or quadrinopia, depending on the size of the lesion. Sometimes you'll get denervation sensation again here in the form of scintillations, flashing lights, and they exist in the blind spot. Um, so if the patient is giving that um, descriptor, then it probably is um, hemianopia or quadrinopia, and then you can test them. Oh, you test them anyway. Uh, I can remember I was teaching a class in um, Calgary at home. And I went home at the end of the, the class day, sat there and I didn't feel great. I felt a bit oozy and woozy. And um, I went to get on the phone and there was something wrong with my vision. Like I knew there was something wrong with it, but I didn't know what it was. Anyway, I tested me and filled out and I'd lost the lateral vision out of my left eye pretty much completely. And, and the right eye I screwed up testing anyway. But I would completely gone blind now. I didn't know about it until I actually tested for it. Um, it turned out that this is my first attack of um, atypical migraine where there was no headache. At least that's what I like to believe. <clears throat> it was seven years ago and it hasn't killed me yet, so I think I'm probably right. Okay, so three, four and six all have the same stuff except Three. Now, three also has a dilated pupil, myodriasis. My, my um, and that's not a symptom um, in itself. It can be seen. The patient may well report it, um, in which case it is a symptom, but you can see it. Um, but what you're going to have here is strabismus, a wonky eye. The eye is pulled off to one side, which technically speaking for you is a sign. For this patient, it would be a symptom. They saw it, they report it. Um, Diplopia, um, because of the strabismus, because the eyes are not aligned, um, either not diverging properly or converging properly, then you end up with two um, two uh, images. Now that's usually reported by as blurred vision by the patient, but the blurred vision can actually be present as opposed to diplopia, because they may have nystagmus as well, um, and they may report that as a symptom. But they may have nystagmus, and that will that can blur the vision. Um, okay, so that's the same symptom for all of them, except that cranial nerve three also has myodriasis. Uh, five, trigeminal. Um, it's the it's responsible for all of the non-special sensation in all of the head and a good way down the neck. So this goes down to at least three and possibly lower. Um, so what you're going to see there is either patchy um, parasitic areas, uh, which is actually fairly common, you know, a little patch here, or it can be the whole hemiface or a quarter of the face or a third of the face. Um, but if this is central, it's not going to be broken up into the nice three branches of the trigeminal nerve. So it's often patchy, but it may cover the whole half of the face. You can also get it where it's around the lips, their perioral numbness, and it's bilateral, even though the lesion may be unilateral. Um, and this is a quirk of the um, of a nerve that reaches the cortex and from the, the um, trigeminal nucleus, and it does innovate bilaterally. Um, at least that's what's believed. But either perioral numbness is either caused by VBI or it's caused by panic attacks and hyperventilation. If um, you want to get rid of the idea it's hyperventilation, Ask the patient if they are hyperventilated or panicky when this is happening. Um, it also supplies the tongue for taste and also for um, 
tactile and pain sensation. So paresthesia in the tongue, um, but also dis, uh, not for taste, sorry. Um, but that loss of sensation can also give you dyscusia. And you've probably had that sensation when you've been at the dentist and they've given you a local anesthetic and you're left with that metal taste in your mouth. That's dyscusia. Um, then eight, cochlear pulsion. Deafness, loss of hearing, hypoacusia, and more likely tinnitus. Um, unless the onset of deafness is very sudden and very profound, the patient won't notice it. Their spouse might, but they won't. Um, but tinnitus is something that, you, that they will get. And this could be high frequency or low frequency tinnitus. And tinnitus tends to be um, high frequency when there's a central um, problem involved. Eight, uh, vestibular, the vestibular portion of the eighth nerve, and this is dizziness. Vertigo, oscillopsia, or pre syncope dizziness, or um, combined. Nine, this uh, glossopharyngeal, it supplies one tongue muscle. Um, so this arthria usually isn't that much of a problem, but it's dysphagia can do because it also supplies the soft palate and um, yeah, so that can make the swallowing difficult. Uh, it also supplies taste for part of the tongue, so dyscusia as well. Um, ten, uh, apart from everything else it supplies, it supplies the laryngeal muscles. So if these are paralytic or paralytic, you get dysphonia, a harsh, rasping voice similar to laryngitis but without the pain. Then 11, uh, triceps. Uh, you're, the symptom here is the patient reports atrophy. Um, now they're not likely to see it in sternomastoid, interestingly enough, because sternomastoid is a bit like the, is supplied by the accessory nerve and it, it's supplied similar to the facial nerve, that is it gets supplied from both hemispheres. So um, it's, there's a backup there as well. So weakness, and atrophy are less obvious with sternomastoid than it is with trapezius. And then um, 12, uh, hypoglossal dysarthria. Now, because the tongue is really screwed up and dyscusia, because the tongue makes a bolus of the food, and if it's not doing a great job on that, then it's going to be more difficult to swallow the food. Cranial nerve one, uh, the soap test. What you do is you get the patient to cover up one nostril, block it, close their eyes and then you introduce a familiar smell under the open nostril. Soap's a good um, idea, particularly unscented soap, because it's going to be around your clinic, um, or it used to be, I mean, basically now with hand soap and everything else is scented, it can be confusing, but something like soap, coffee, uh, anything the patient may be familiar with. And you ask them to, not can you smell this, but can you identify the smell? They say yes or no, you take it away and cover up the other, don't let them see it, cover up the other nostril, tell them you're going to give them a different smell now, um, but give them the same smell. You're not under oath or anything, so lying's okay. And then I, again, ask them if, what the smell is. Um, if you ask them if they can smell it and they say yes, you're then stuck. Well, what is it? It sounds like you don't believe them. So what is this smell? Okay. And you're looking, obviously, for them not to be able to smell the smell. The problem with this is um, at any given time, most of us are walking around with one nostril blocked up and the other one open and they switch. So if it's really blocked up because of an infection or something like that, you're going to run into trouble. But unilateral blockage that's strong enough to stop you smelling a familiar smell is um, going to be because they're completely blocked up and that's going to be obvious before you even start the testing. Okay, this is a confrontation test for field of view. Now, you'll often see this test being done coming from behind the patient this way. The problem is um, you've got no control over the patient's eyes. From the front, you can see their eyes and what's happening. So, um, have them look at your nose. You want about 18 inches or so, two feet between you. And you want to introduce a target. Um, now, she's using her finger. Um, but you want something that's going to clash with the background so it's quite easily seeable. Uh, so oranges work um, and they stay the same shape whichever way your hands are. 
So um, these are introduced, and it has to be introduced halfway between you and the patient. If they're held further away from the patient, closer to you, th this is going to fall well within the patient's um, cone of vision, and they're going to be able to see it regardless of how way you stretch your arms up. You, on the other hand, won't see them because they're closer to um, where the cone is narrow in you. So halfway between you, and level with your eyes to start with anyway, and have your eyes level with each other. Um, you then, um, now she's doing this properly. Um, what you get the patient to do is, in this type case, they cover up one eye, uh, you cover up the opposite eye. Now, this is opposite, opposite, not op if it's a cover up. She's actually covering up the right eye, the patient is, and the, the doctor is covering up the left eye. And then you introduce targets, either from the blind side, as on the right image, or from the open side on the left. So when you're coming from the blind side, you're testing the medial uh, field of view of the left eye. And when you're coming in from the open side, you're testing the lateral field of view of the open eye. Um, and then the, the standard is to make a figure H, if you can take the whole thing. Um, sorry, you introduce, my fault, you introduce it at basically two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, or one, three, and five. Um, and you ask them when they see it. So basically, you're looking at it to match when you see it. So this is why you need your eyes level. And then you, if they can't see it, then you map out the area that they can't see. And then you switch sides and do it again. Now this is a, probably the most precise way of doing it. The other way of doing this though, is you use the cover up eye stuff when you're doing the medial view, but when you're doing the lateral view, you test both eyes at the same time and bring your hands in. There's my other hand gone. There. So you bring both hands in um, until they can see them. So you can either do both eyes together for the lateral field, um, or you can do them individually, left and right eye. But for the medial field, you have to do one eye at a time coming from the blind side of the eye cover. And as I say, then you map out the blind area. Um, if this is neurological, it's going to be bilateral. Um, and it'll either be um, um, heterogeneous or homonymous, that is, um, left and right, uh, the peripheral, peripheral, or medial, medial. Or, but if it's heteronymous, then it's going to be a lateral and medial type of thing. It doesn't really matter which one it is. Um, it's all pathological. If it's a single eye problem, then you're l either looking at a ret well, you are looking at a retinal problem and an optic nerve problem rather than problems beyond the chiasm where the two nerves cross over. Okay, three, four, and six. Um, these control the extraocular muscles, and the cranial nerve three also controls the the intraocular muscles. Now, a couple of things to watch here for is the dilation of the right pupil. Now, it could be, of course, um, constriction of the left pupil. And the way to find out is to look at pupillary reflexes. Now, um, the easiest way for us to do it is if you haven't got a flashlight, is a consensual reflex. And what you do is you cover up one eye, or you get the patient to cover it up, you observe the open eye, and and normally what will happen is that the that pupil will dilate because it's agreeing with the, the covered eye. Now the covered eye is dilating because it's got dark and that will agree with it and dilate. When you uncover it, you should see that go back to being small. You then switch eyes and do exactly the same thing again. Uncover, watch for it to dilate and then go back to being small. So if it's not dilating, then it's myotic. And if it's um, not constricting, then it's myodriatic. So um, that's a consensual reflex. It's the easiest one to do. Or you can use a flashlight and the consensual reflex then is done by covering up, shining the light in this eye and looking at this eye to see it lighting up and then taking it away. Then moving it. You can also go backwards and forwards and watch for them to fatigue and not change. Um, the top picture actually shows strabismus. Now, what you can see is that the left eye ball is in a different position to the right eyeball. Question is, which one of the two is not in its normal gaze position? Now, if you was used to doing this, you would know, and I don't. I'm, it's not something I'm used to doing, um, to be honest with you. We look at patients, 
We look at people's faces casually, whereas a neurologist or an ophthalmologist or a, ophthalmologist or a ophthalmologist will look at the eyes more critically. We don't see that many eyes. We don't see it. But which one do you think is a problem? Is the right is the left eye abducted or is the right eye adapted? So there is a way of finding out. Let's see it. Okay, tracking. Um, so it's the cranial nerve three, four, and six. And basically, your target is held about 18 inches or so away from the eyes. Um, you can go a bit close, but don't come too far back, otherwise you're not going to really track it very well. And you basically make a letter H. So let, across, up and down. And what you can see here is that um, the center position is the one we just looked at. And the one of those is in the... Um, gaze position, the other one's out of position. Uh, when he looks to the left, to his left, both eyes move over. When he looks to the right, the right eye doesn't move over. So what we have here is an abducens paralysis. Now what's interesting is the amount of asymmetry is not very much. That abducens is the lateral pull of the eye. And if this is completely paralyzed, you would expect the medial muscles to pull it way over. Some people, it does happen. You see these people like that. Um, but in this case, the, um, the strabismus is not obvious. There's no obvious um, difference between the two. You can see the difference, but whether one's, which one's pathological, if either of them are, it's difficult to tell. But when you start moving it, that's when it becomes obvious. Don't go too fast with this. It's a slow track. Um, otherwise, you're likely to induce nystagmus, which only complicates things. Cranial nerve five. Um, now, she's actually doing it right. You'll see a lot of textbooks where they're testing on the outside of the face. There's a lot of overlap from the upper cranial, uh, upper cervical levels. So it's going to be a lot less sensitive on the side of the face um, than it is in the center. So. This is best tested along the median aspects, close into midline, and you can see they're doing that. My suggestion is for very um, sensitive testing, test bilaterally simultaneously. Now, I think he's using cotton wool, um, but if you're gonna use um, light touch, use either a fishing line, a piece of fishing line, um, a monofilament, but not strong enough that it pokes, um, and not tip it, so you want a decent weight monofilament um, but not jammy weight and or if you're going to use um, something like cotton wool don't rub it down dab it on because if you rub it down you stimulate hair cells and so on so you're better off with something that gets in between the hair cells and doesn't stimulate those they tend to be more robust uh, then there's a jaw jerk um, finger or thumb goes over there and you smack your thumb while that they relax. If you want to make this a bit more sensitive, if you put a tongue depressor on the bottom teeth and tap the depressor, you'll get a, um, it's more sensitive. So you're looking for a very brisk response. The problem you've got here is you've got no comparison. So you're looking for something that's outside of your experience, really. Okay, facial nerve. Um, as discussed earlier, the face is supplied the facial muscles are supplied from both hemispheres. The muscles below the eye are supplied by the um, opposite side, and the, the, the muscles above the eye are supplied from the same side. And the, for let's say the left side of the face, these fibers will converge um, in the nucleus. So a lesion above the nucleus will leave the sound the right side will leave the supraorbital muscles still supplied from the right hemisphere, while the infraorbital muscles supplied from the um, left hemisphere uh, will be gone, while the supraorbital muscles remain the same. So if there's a lesion above, the supraorbital muscles will be spared. Um, if the lesion lies through the nucleus or below the nucleus, then all of the muscles are affected. The lady in the middle shows exactly that. Um, they're doing a smile and frown test, whether or in this case it's a smile and be surprised test, not as pithy as smile and frown. Um, but the effect is the same. When you frown, you activate corrugator. When you look surprised, you have front occipital frontalis, um, and they will work both corrugator and occipital frontalis. So you can do either one. Some patients are easier if you say you look surprised because they can't frown on demand. 
Um, but anyway, look at her face on the right hand side of the screen there. And it doesn't look terrible. I mean, there's some asymmetry there, but we're all a bit asymmetrical. Um, and if you didn't know she had a fatal nerve palsy from that, you probably wouldn't see it there. What is apparent if you're used to looking at these, which I'm not again, um, is that the eye is a bit wider on the right because the lower eyelid is being pulled down by gravity while the upper eyelid is still is supplied by levator power brain, which isn't affected with this. So the eye looks more open and the lips on the right side look a bit more dragged down. So you can see that the it doesn't look terrible, but you know there's an asymmetry there. Now, when she's asked to smile, the left lips go up quite nicely um, and the eye crinkles up, whereas on the other side, um, the lips don't go up and the eye doesn't shift. You don't get any closing of that eye. She's asked to close her eyes there um, in the third picture along. And you can see she does that normally on the left side of her face. But on the right side, the lips don't sort of grimace and the eye doesn't shut as tight as it does on the unaffected side. And when she's asked to look surprised, the left eyebrow goes up and the right eyebrow doesn't match it at all. Looking at the man on the far right of the screen, left of the screen, sorry. Um, anyway, the man, you can see that um, when he's asked to smile, the asymmetry is really quite obvious. Uh, the left side is doing nothing at all. The smile is all on the right side. When he's asked to look surprised, it's normal. Um, so this is a central problem. The lady is a peripheral nerve problem. This test stimulates the labyrinth. Um, and isolates the labyrinth from the neck. So what happens then will depend not just on the labyrinth though, but on the neurological connections and the neurophysiological interplay between the eyes, the um, lack of proprioception coming in from the neck, uh, the neurovascular system and so on. So all you're doing is stimulating the labyrinth and then seeing what happens. So the way you do this is you have the patient sitting with their legs along the bed and upright. You revolve them by the back of the head and um, by the forehead, by, the back, by their back and their forehead, and you tilt them backwards and forwards. Uh, large amplitude movements and then side to side and you can even go in circles with it. Now the trick is when you're doing this is not to move your hands because that's going to move the neck. So you move your body. So your body's up against theirs and you move forwards, backwards and sideways and you stimulate the um, labyrinth. And normally what will happen is nothing. The patient will tolerate this quite happily. If on the other hand there is a vestibular disturbance, and when I say vestibular I mean a balance disturbance in the system, you are likely to get um, dizziness. Now if the labyrinth is at fault, you're almost certainly going to get vertigo. If another part of the system is at fault, or if this is a neurophysiological problem, then you may get type 2 dizziness rather than type 1 dizziness or vertigo. And that's the test. Uh, you can observe the eyes from the stagmas. You can do it with the eyes open or closed. Um, what I would do is if the patient is already complaining of um, ongoing dizziness when they move too much, is tip them with the eyes in whatever position they want. If that doesn't make him dizzy, then have him do the opposite, either open or close them, and then do it again, and one or the other is likely to make him dizzy. So this is it. Stimulate the labyrinth, see what happens. Okay, so we're looking for deafness now. Um, you can use tuning forks for this. Um, so the first one is Weber's test, and basically, you have a tuning fork, usually 128 is a sort of a, a nice mixture of fairly high frequency, but still vibrating enough for it to make itself known. So 128 um, is a pretty good frequency with this. Anything higher than that, you won't get enough vibration and it makes it more difficult. Um, so you either put it in the middle of the forehead, which I've done there, or you can put it on top of the head, but midline. Now, they should hear it equally on both sides. So they hear it in the middle and spreading out, and they may hear it in both ears, but they hear it on both sides equally. If they're deaf in one ear, they will hear it better in one ear. Um, now, it depends on the type of deafness as to which ear they hear it in. If you are neurologically deaf, um, then all forms of hearing are blocked. If you have conduction deafness, then air conduction hearing is blocked, but bone conduction is actually enhanced. Um, I have no idea why that would be, but it is. So 
which ear is deaf depends on which uh, which ear is whether the deaf ear is neurological or conduction deafness. You can't really tell from this. All you can say is one ear is deafer than the other one um, by bone conduction. So you have to find out which ear is the deafer of the two. So Weber's test isn't very good for doing that. Um, Ryan's test does it better, but it's fiddly. So Ryan's test, <coughs> you get the, um, the tuning fork vibrating, you put the stem against the mastoid, and you ask the patient when they no longer hear the or feel the vibrations. Um, and they'll take it as here. So don't vibrate too hard, because you can be there 15 minutes waiting for anything to run down. So fairly light, touch it on there. And as soon as they say they can't hear it anymore, you switch it and make them to the times against here and ask them if they can still hear it. Now they should do. If the ear is normal, then they will hear um, air conduction after bone conduction has stopped. If they still hear, if they uh, if they cannot hear the times vibrating by air conduction, then they're deaf in that ear. And then Weber's test will tell you whether it's neurological or whether it's not. So the way Weber's test now works is um, if I'm deaf, I'm deaf. If I've got neurological deafness, it doesn't matter whether the sound gets to me by air conduction or bone conduction, that is deaf that ear. So if I put the um, tuning fork center line and they hear it in the ear that was found to be deaf with Ryan's test, they can hear. So that is not neurological, that's bone conduction hearing, that's a conduction loss, an air conduction hearing loss. If they hear it in the good ear though, then that deaf ear is neurological deafness, sensory neural hypoacusia. Now you can do it a different way. No tuning forks. So this is a finger rust one hum test. So basically you make very, very minor sounds by their ears. Um, if it's too loud, they won't be able to tell whether one side's gone or not. So this is very small, just on the threshold of the hearing and you reduce the force at which you're rubbing your fingers um, to the point where they lose it. So if they lose it on both sides, it, both ears are equally hearing. If they lose it on one side, that side is deafer than the other. Now, you then get them to plug their ears and hum, and that's the tuning fork with Weber's test now. So if they hear it in the deaf ear, which you found by the finger rustle test, that's air conduction testing. If they hear it in the good ear, then the Deaf ear is neurologically deaf. Think about it, it takes a little bit of thought, a little bit of practice. Um, it's not intuitive, um, so you will have to give some thought to this. Cranial nerve nine and 10, and maybe 11. Um, there's some this, um, debate as to which exactly uh, works this area. First thing to say though is, <coughs> unless you've got a laryngoscope and you know how to use it, you cannot test. Um, cranial nerve 10 for dysphonia, you just have to go with the symptoms. So this is the phonation test or the R test if you prefer. Basically the patient opens their mouth and say R. Now you can hold the tongue down but you usually don't need to. Before they do anything the tongue may cover the um, pharyngeal, uh, the uvula and the uh, soft palate but usually when they say R the tongue will drop down you can see what's happening. So what should happen is that the uvula and soft palate lifts up so what you can see there is two arches on either side of the uvula and they should remain equal. On this picture what you can see is the uvula is deviating to the uh, patient's left um, and the arch on the left is higher than the arch on the right. So it's the uvula and the, the um, soft part has been pulled over that way because of weakness on the other side. So it's pulled towards the strong side. Okay, 11, the accessory nerve. This supplies both the sternomastoid and the trapezius. Um, what you can see looking at this patient is the patient on the right clearly has atrophy of the right trapezius. On the left, it's not clear. Um, you've got that bump in the left trapezius, but actually that's probably the rib and the atrophy has occurred in that trapezius. You can also see that the scapula is winging because it's going to be the lower trapezius is also affected. So right atrophy, left atrophy. The test is 
strength tested trapezius, having to shrug the shoulders up and push down. And generally speaking, you're not going to break this on any adult, male or female. Um, and a lot of children are going to resist this as well. Um, you haven't got a lot of leverage and the muscles are reasonably strong ones. So generally speaking, you don't break this. You really can't test sternum mastoid for a couple of reasons. One, as I say, it's got bilateral innovation, which means that it's a lot less sensitive to one side um, being in trouble. Also, though, if you're trying to strength test sternum mastoid and you're treating a patient with a reasonably acute neck, you're going to compress the neck when you do so and torsion it and shear it, and it's going to bother the neck. Whereas trapezius, not so much. So um, there's a strength test there. You can also do a tendon reflex where you hit them basically in the front of the belly and you look for the response. Um, and you're looking for hyperreflexia now. However, the accessory, the glossopharyngeal, all of these exit through the skull, and they are prone to um, to compression and damage at that point. And when you see a lot of atrophy, it's usually is a lower motor neuron leading a peripheral neuropathy that's causing it. Um, this can happen with backpacks as well, carrying big, heavy backpacks for long periods. This can produce the same trapezius wasting. And finally, hypoglossal. Um, this is a major supplier of the tongue muscles. So this is um, all of them except for one. So what you're looking for here is atrophy, particularly if this is lower motor neuron. Um, but you won't see that as much as, as if it's upper motor neuron. Um, but the test here is tongue protrusion. Look for the atrophy, and you can see it on this picture on the left side. And the tongue will now swing towards the weak side. Imagine two pistons pushing the tongue, one's pushing harder, so it's going to turn it that away from itself. So there you see it, tongue deviation away from the strong side. have it the cranial nerve test um try to forget the mnemonic all right mnemonics are memory aids they're not learning aids if you do this test enough it's, it'll be automatically what will tell you what these nerves are um stop trying to remember this and understand it instead and use it every neck patient that comes in my strong suggestion is you do this exam on them just to get used to doing it um and it's an important part of the exam you're going to be manipulating necks and you're taking responsibility for not damaging that patient when you do so. Make sure you know how to take that responsibility responsibly. Okay, Grace, talk to you soon. Bye.